गुड मॉर्निंग नमस्कार वेलकम अ फ्रेश वीक बिगिन्स एंड सो डू वी एज ऑन एडिटोरियल एज ओवर द कोर्स ऑफ द नेक्स्ट से फोर्टी फाइव टू सिक्सटी ऑड मिनट्स वी विल टेक अ लुक एट थ्री इंपॉर्टेंट टॉपिक्स थ्री इंपॉर्टेंट से आर्टिकल्स दैट हैव बीन पब्लिश्ड ओवर द कोर्स ऑफ द वीकेंड ऑल राइट एंड आई विल ऑल्सो टेक अ लुक एट से सम सर्टन एम सी क्यूज दैट विल ओरिजिनेट आउट ऑफ दीज पर्टिकुलर टॉपिक्स Please understand now these topics have been in the news and have to be looked at for, both from the prelims as well as mains perspective, and so we'll try and do that over the course of the next say forty five sixty minutes. Okay, Bulbul Raghavendra, good morning. Thanks for joining, guys. Thank you. Uh, so the first one that I have for you is the Sulina Channel. Now this has been in the news why? Because uh, the Black Sea Grain Initiative that uh, Russia pulled out of, okay, which was uh, central to say Ukraine's. Uh, a lot of finances plus obviously are looking at engagement with the rest of the world that was hindered okay so ukraine was looking at say an alternative how to say sustain its own exports make sure that it continues engagement economically with the rest of the world well it went ahead and found a plan b a route b so that is the solina channel so we'll take a look at solina channel tom good morning welcome welcome second we'll take a look at green hydrogen now this has been in the news almost uh, for a large majority of the year for say one reason or the other and so it merits that we take a, a deeper look at it and thirdly the last one is brics wherein the prime minister is expected to go tomorrow august the 22nd and 23rd he will be in south africa so we should take a look at brics you know uh, what is the agenda of the meeting this time what are the impediments what are the challenges and what is india seeking to achieve in the brics meeting to be held in south africa okay so that's the agenda for the day let's straight away jump into it uh, you can join me on instagram by the way if you have any particular questions for me go ahead scan this become a part of it and the pdf of this particular lecture which we will be in fact having over the course of the next say uh, 60 odd minutes that will be available on this channel the, the telegram channel go ahead scan it and access this entire pdf all right so the questions from the last class by the way just very very briefly we'll take a look at them Agarkar Research Institute Department of Science and Tech absolutely correct in fact this is the institute that went ahead and engaged in a lot of research finding 62 dt plant varieties that we discussed in detail in the last class shubhankar good morning jai hind thanks for joining okay so this is in pune agarkar research institute so this is obviously correctly matched institute of wood science and technology okay this is in bengaluru and uh, is directly uh, it reports to the moe fcc so again this is correct this engages in say research and development of woods and the products that can be uh, uh, say designed out of those sustainably okay and you're looking at national institute for ocean technology again ministry of earth sciences i have mentioned in the past if you have been following minister kiran rijiju on twitter you will see he regularly posts updates about uh, the matsya 6000 program which the national institute of ocean technology is coordinating so this is again also correct so the correctly matched here all three okay the next question i had for you was again a very simple question and if you have been reading your ncrts well straight away this statement will strike out to you like a sore thumb okay there's a reason why the himalayas are called as the young fold mountains okay so straight away this will stick out if you have been going through your ncrts if you have been taking your preparation seriously at least the initial bit well this statement will straight away jump out to you okay himalayas are in fact the young fold mountains deccans the whole deccan area is a lot older when you read about say the whole mountain the continent building and how say the indian plate and the eurasian plate collided and the tibet plate had an interplay in it and finally the himalayas came of age so that would give you the answer to this okay so the correctly matched here 1 2 and 4 okay make a note of caste plateau i suggest because this also has been in the news and you will find that the agarkar research institute is also related to this plateau research of something or the other in this particular region also okay nanika good morning good morning all right so these were the individuals who answered the questions correctly uh indian super i do not know what happened here but you know who you are okay so shubhankar indian super priya pooja tanu karuna aditya akshay and rahul well they reached out to me on ig the rest of them on yt and thank you so much firstly for your patronage i'm happy to see that you are seeing the questions taking part learning which is what the entire focus of this entire exercise is that we have outcome based learning okay so to the rest well i have questions for you today go ahead and try and answer them and maybe maybe just maybe if you get all of them correct you will find your name here tomorrow morning at 6:30 am all right 
So let's look at the Sulina channel now. All right. So the Russia, what did Russia do? It targeted ports and grain storage facilities along the Danube River in Ukraine. All right. So up until now, say previously, we have been uh, encountered, if you have been through this uh, particular, if you have been a regular watcher of this program, you will know that we had discussed earlier the Dnieper River, okay, which again originates from say Russia and flows into the Black Sea via Ukraine. You find that the Ukrainian, uh, the particular nuclear plant facility, the Zaforizha nuclear plant facility on the banks of this river. So this was in the news. Why? Because you had that particular dam, that barrage that was uh, broken, that was damaged, a lot of water flew into towards and a lot of flooding had happened. So that was one part of the lecture. Now we are looking at the Danube River. Okay. So what does Russia do? It goes ahead and targets grains and storage facilities on the banks of this particular river. Now, the Danube Delta has provided Ukraine with an alternative passage after the failure, the exit of Russia from the Black Sea Grain Deal, wherein Russia and say Ukraine had come to an agreement to provide safe passage to say exports, agricultural exports that would be allowed safely to pass through uh, the area. Well, that Russia did uh, not agree to anymore after the Russia-Ukraine crisis broke out. Okay. So, where, what did uh, Ukraine do? Found an alternative, a route B. And that exactly is the Solina Channel. All right. So, this alternative trade route that Ukraine came up with, the Solina Channel, connecting major Ukrainian ports on the river to the Black Sea. Okay. And what you find is that there is an involvement of the country of Romania in it. Okay. So, if you look at the map, right. So, here is the Danube River. What you find is that it originates here in Germany, all right, towards, uh, say, Western Germany. And in fact, if you are to go ahead and analyze the course of River Danube, you will find that it is one of the most major, uh, say, international rivers. It spans the length of 10 countries. Okay. Eventually, at the mouth, it in fact originates in uh, Germany. Thereafter, traverses and finally at the mouth, where it is finally meeting a Black Sea, you find that it is at the coast of Romania. All right. And Ukraine is now looking to take exam, uh, say, advantage of this alternative trade route. But it finds that there is a lot of challenges and we will seek to understand what are the challenges for Ukraine now. All right. So if you look at the whole course, again, 10 uh, uh, particular countries that this whole river traverses, finally draining into the Black Sea. Now, what do you find here? That where it drains, essentially you are finding a network of three channels, three distributaries. Okay, You are finding a huge delta being created and that delta is primarily due to three particular channels that are responsible for this. Okay, So, we will seek to understand the Solina channel which is a part of it. All right. So, these uh, are the more factual analysis for you. The Danube River originating in the Black Forest region of Germany. First things, number one, okay. Where does it originate? Black Forest. Where is Black Forest? Germany. Now, the river then flows eastward, like I told you, from Germany. It starts its course until it re reaches the Black Sea, going eastwards eventually, branching out into three different channels, okay. It is the second longest river in Europe right after the Volga, Volga, which does not, in fact, drain into the Black Sea. If you are watching this live, can you very quickly let me know? Where does the Volga drain into? Okay, I'll give you options. Is it Caspian Sea, Mediterranean Sea, Sea of Okhotsk or uh, none of the above? Let me know in the chat. Okay, so Danube River, the second longest after Volga, it passes through the borders of 10 countries, which is why it is one of the most internationally, say, uh, a lot of cooperation between the 10 states through which the river traverses. Okay, so what are the 10 states? First, originating from the Black Forest region, of Germany, then Austria, Slovakia, Hungary, Croatia, Serbia, Bulgaria, Romania, Moldova and Ukraine. Alright, correct, Shubhankar, fair enough, good answer, good answer. Okay, so now let's look at what has exactly happened here. So like I told you, after it reaches the mouth of, uh, in fact it starts to drain into Black Sea, what you find is that there are three channels, A, B, and see. Okay. In fact, I'm going to use a different marker so that you can see it clearly. Okay. So now of our interest today is channel B. 
okay earlier you had the chilia channel that was being used however what you found was that again this was in the line of russian aggression so now the plan b the route b was the sulina channel okay now what is to be understood here is that because of the massive say river system the whole uh, river system now going ahead and diverging into say three different channels a lot of focus is now on the sulina channel sure purely because of the fact that the uppermost channel is in fact under threat okay and now that russia has gone ahead gone out of the black sea grain deal what you find is that most of the say exports that ukraine wants to go ahead and send to the rest of the world is happening through this trade route however there are some constraints that are in operation okay not just say russian aggression we will take a look at the sulina channel now the eastern part of romania okay connecting river danube to black sea from the exam perspective here is your first mcq okay that who, what, what is this channel collecting connecting number 1 river the danube connecting to the black sea okay you now know that river danube has three primary channels sulina being the middle one okay you had the chilia channel and then you have another george channel the southernmost okay so if you were to just go ahead and say draw it the northernmost channel of river danube is the chilia channel in the middle you have the sulina channel and finally the southernmost is the george channel all right make a note of this please okay so now what you are finding is that this particular area has given ukraine with an alternative passage and ships carrying grain from ukraine now leave the ukrainian ports which were earlier on the chilia channel now they can't go from that side so they take the sulina channel route and then eventually they go ahead and export after they exit the danube river okay so now the challenges number 1 firstly congestion because the channel is narrow you are finding that say it is unable to uh, uh, be accessible for the heavy container ships which means ukraine if it wants to go ahead and export what it needs is say medium size vessels okay it goes ahead sends those uh, whole exports to the mouth of river danube the ports there okay the, the ports there and eventually what happen is that the ports at the mouth of the river danube they are unable to say handle all the capacity they do not have the capacity to deal with such vast amount massive amounts of exports the volume of exports is far too high not just for the ports but also for uh, the channel okay so which is why the time taken say for an export of a particular product is long okay number 2 like i told you the capacity of ukrainian ports it's just not enough infrastructure you find is not as developed as say the other ports of uh, ukraine in the chilia channel which is why the process is slow and this whole process now is getting exacerbated by the actions of russian hostilities okay so these are the three particular channels that uh, challenges that you need to identify in so far as the ukrainian strategy to go ahead and use the sulina channel for increasing its exports to the rest of the world is concerned all right nikhil i will be starting the arena in fact the arena series will be continuing this week okay i will be updating uh, when the class uh, shall begin most likely we are looking at the first class happening on wednesday if i can just give you a basic overview most likely on wednesday evening but i will be updating the final information on my telegram channel theek hai all right now let's look at these questions guys now what you are going to do is answer these questions make a note of them i have given you the overview i have given you the basic mcqs that you can expect out of this particular topic go ahead and answer them and leave an answer for me in the comment box so you have questions from say a to f all right so this is the first one black forest not the cake <laughs> but the forest which country is it in number 2 black sea now you know as an from the exam perspective okay let me be very honest from the exam perspective i would advise you that you go ahead look at the black sea and the countries that are say have a coastline with black sea okay go ahead and look at say the countries that have a drainage or, or a contribution to black sea through their rivers okay understand that uh, black sea's uh, uh, strategic importance is prime in this russia ukraine crisis so those would be say my advice to you if you have to go ahead and read 
further into this topic. Okay. So, Black Sea again, does it share a coast with Slovakia? Yes or no? Number three, River Danube, does it pass through uh, Romania? Okay. You will let me know the answers in the comment box to question number A. Question B, like I told you, number one, six countries have coastlines with the Black Sea. The drainage basin of Black Sea is lesser than the number of coastline countries. Now, if you were to just go ahead and uh, just think for a moment, okay, that, uh, well, it's the second largest river after Volga, okay. I have given you this particular information. So, would statement to be correct or not based on that information, you know. Not every information can be recalled by you in the examination. Sometimes, you need to infer based on facts that you already know. So, go ahead and attempt that. Statement 2. Statement 3. The primary rivers that drain into the Black Sea include Volga. Okay. You will let me know the answers to question number B also in the comment box. Okay. I suggest that you give it a, in, the answers in a tabular format so that it is just little easier for me to go ahead and collate whichever answers are correct or incorrect. Okay. All right. Before we go forward, by the way, uh, closing in fact on Wednesday uh, evening, 6 p.m. is this particular initiative of Study IQ, the Prelims to Interview Initiative. Several batches are already underway. The response from the student community, I must appreciate. It's been enormously appreciated by all of us here. It's been very nice. Okay. I'm personally uh, involved with uh, the, uh, the 11th August uh, batch. We are doing a lot of good work in geography. And so if you're still in the double minds regarding what should I do for Civil Services 2024, well, firstly, do it yourself is better. If you can do it yourself, if you can find the motivation, the strategy, everything, good. If not, if you need a little bit of hand-holding, a little bit of guidance, a little bit of strategy orientation, go ahead, sign up for this program, okay? Uh, go ahead and use the code BA Live because, well, two things happen after that. First, you get a good discount, okay? And number two, I get the opportunity to be a part of your preparation, all right? So, this closes on the 23rd of August. The description to sign up for this particular program will be uh, the link, in fact, will be in the description box below or you can head up to studyiq.com under the live courses, select it under the language of your choice. If you want the course delivery to be in Hindi, well, Hindi, bilingual, again, the material will be provided in English and if you want it to be purely in English, of which I am a part of, well, that's also available, okay? So, the batch is beginning on the 23rd, 6 p.m. Make haste, come to a decision ASAP. All right, number two, green hydrogen. Shubankar, fair enough. Okay. You have got most of them correct. Good, good. Six, six countries on a chain. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Good. Okay. Green hydrogen. Now, uh, two things that you need to understand in terms of this topic. Okay. From the exam perspective again, let's, let's first look, exactly understand the outcome-based learning that I always stress on. From the exam perspective, you have to understand that when you talk about green hydrogen, okay, you need to understand the different types of hydrogen. So, you're looking at, say, ground hydrogen, okay, you're looking at grey hydrogen, okay, the different sorts of hydrogen, the different names, you need to be aware of that. And in focus for green hydrogen, you also need to be aware of the institutions. So, for example, the first institution that you will be going and talking about is the MNRE, the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, which has gone ahead and notified a hydrogen standard for India, okay. Basically, what happens for a policy? First, you have, say, the framework, okay, what the policy entails. Then you go ahead and give the institutions the charge of implementing that policy. And before you go ahead and give an institution the charge of implementing a policy, you need to have, say, some certain standards and certain benchmarks by which you will evaluate, say, the success or the failure of the policy. Is that not common sense, guys? Okay. Chippy, I just uh, had announced uh, earlier in the class. I think you joined late. But Wednesday, most likely we'll have the RNA series. But right now, focus on the topic. Okay. For sure, Chippy, I will update it on my uh, Telegram channel also. Abhi, ab idhar samjho pehle. That for implementing a policy, okay, even though you say you need firstly an institutional framework, which means a particular body, an organization, you also need certain standards by which you will go ahead and evaluate, okay, whether a policy has is succeeding or failing, has stalled or has stalled or what has happened. Correct? So now, the Ministry of uh, Renewable Energy and the second body that we look at is BEE. Okay, I, I must complete what I started. So, you have firstly the MNRE, okay, the Renewable Energy and number two is the Bureau of Energy Efficiency. Now, this is under the Ministry of Power. Alright, so two things first. The science of green hydrogen is uh, 
you know, easily available and I will be explaining it to you also. But understand the policy implementation first, okay. So, MNRE and Ministry of Power. Now, what does the new and renewable energy ministry has done? It has gone ahead and notified the green hydrogen standard for India, outlining the emission thresholds for production of hydrogen that can be classified as green. Exactly. That what exactly it means is that you go ahead and set the standards in line with the global best practices. Every country has its own standard it sets in so far as green hydrogen is concerned. Now, what do I mean by say standards? For example, when you try to go ahead and produce green hydrogen, you are going to need some sort of energy. Some sort of fuel will be needed to drive that energy. Correct? And post that process, there will be emissions. Which means, for this whole thing to be classified as green, you need to go ahead and minimize, say, coal input here as far as possible and when you are going ahead and getting emissions either you go ahead and carbon capture or sequestration are these the only methods so that you go ahead and make the process green not just the product green pranjul aapko bhi happy nag panchim good good okay are you understanding this for the whole thing to be green it can't be that you go ahead and fire say coal based plants all right then go and prepare green hydrogen and then claim that yes, the product is green. Doesn't work that way. Right? So you need to have, you be sustainable right from the very start to end. And once it comes to the end, the emissions that are there, you need to make sure that they are getting either captured or sequestered. Correct? This is the whole point of the policy. Alright? So, <coughs> excuse me. Green hydrogen is the name given to hydrogen gas that has been produced using renewables such as wind, solar power, which creates no GHG emissions. The point is to make the process green, your input should be green, your output should also be green, not just the product. Correct? Because again, if you consider this, say electric vehicles considered to be green, okay, use cobalt. Now, the process of mining cobalt is neither green nor sustainable. You look at the human rights abuses also, asked by the way this year in UPSC Civil Services 2023, you know, the Congo, DRC. So, do you realize the whole process has to be green. You can't just have an isolated area that is green and then you claim that, okay, this is green. No. Alright. So, while hydrogen gas does not emit GHGs when burnt, the electricity or the energy may be done by fossil fuels. So, when it is being done by fossil fuels, when the input is fossil fuels, non-green, which means this becomes grey hydrogen. Okay, make a note, grey hydrogen, your input is non uh, is uh, totally say coal based or something that is not non-renewable, not renewable in fact. Okay, next, hydrogen produced using electricity generated by burning say coal but paired with CCS, alright. So, when you have say your input is coal based but you go ahead and your next two phases are green which means it becomes blue hydrogen. That's all you need to remember. The relationship between input, product, output. Based on that, you either go ahead and classify it as green, blue, grey. Think of the colour, you justify it. That's the way it goes. This is the primary framework. You don't need to go ahead and remember and ratify, no. Remember this particular <coughs> flowchart and it will follow. Okay, next. So look at it guys, now that you know the flowchart, you will be able to tell me which one is green, which one is blue, which one is grey. Go ahead. Is this not the flowchart? Grey hydrogen, you have natural gas, alright, straight away. Here is your product, eventually you are looking at say one particular part that is non uh, not focused on renewables, which means grey. The moment you go ahead and sequester it, alright. Okay, the moment you go ahead and uh, say uh, sequester it, it becomes blue. Yes, you have gone ahead and sequestered it. And in green, well, everything is, there is no output in fact. The emissions are zero, is it not? The byproduct will be a non renewable source of energy. In green hydrogen, firstly, you are looking at say no emissions coming out because, well, look at this particular line, Shubhankar. This is what I have prepared here. Have a look. Okay. 
वन सेकेंड हैव लुक एट दिस पर्टिकुलर लाइन दिस इज द लन वेन हाइड्रोजन गैस डज नॉट एमिट जी एच जी इज वेन बर्न विच मीन्स एनी वेज यू डोट नीड टू गो हैड एंड से गेट इन टू द सी सी एस टेक्नोलॉजीज एनी वेज देर आर नो एमिशंस हाउ for say uh, grey and uh, blue for blue you need to go ahead and ccs engage in carbon capture and sequestration okay you are going to go ahead and capture the emissions only then can you be considered to be in line with the green philosophy that we are talking about correct this is the whole flow chart that's green hydrogen done for you all right look at it now the standards that are being placed in india so firstly we have become the few countries this is a welcome step because you find that most of the western countries have gone ahead and set up their own standards what are the standards so straight away your well to gate emission okay which means the moment you start from say extraction of feed stock to going ahead and getting your generation of electricity right from the very beginning from the way you go ahead and source your raw material to your emissions okay well to gate remember this term from uh, the examination perspective okay i am again going to write it here the well to gate emission standards okay so right from the very beginning now you know that livestock again is a, a emission intensive uh, say sector so right from there up until you go ahead and uh, say the the emissions that are created the by product all of that is created after the product is done everything needs to be factored in and for that you are looking at not more than 2 kg of co2 per kg of hydrogen okay very very important from the exam perspective guys not just the definition of well to gate but also the standards that are being recommended by the ministry of uh, new and renewable energy theek okay? hai extremely important in fact so what does the well to gate emission include right from say water treatment electrolysis gas purification drying compression of hydrogen you are beginning right from the livestock to the processes to the product finally to the emissions theek hai so what does it say that the bureau of energy efficiency bee the one that goes ahead and labels your particular uh, uh, bulbs or say uh, these lights the efficiency of that is graded by bee if you have gone ahead and have a look at the bulb in your house you will see that it is graded your acs are graded 3 star 4 star 5 star what does that mean it talks about the energy efficiency okay you will find that a 3 star ac will cost reasonably less than a 5 star ac why because the energy efficiency is low which means your electricity usage will be high okay so that is done by the bee it does the standards for the goods the products so what does the ministry of new and renewable energy say that the notification says that the bee under ministry of power will be the nodal authority for accreditation of agencies that the other agencies that will now go ahead and engage in the production of green hydrogen and that standard is that you do not produce more than 2 kg of carbon dioxide per kg of hydrogen and that accreditation will be done by the bee okay so to the two particular organizations you need to be aware of the standards being set by mnre to be implemented by bee clear hai okay all right so go ahead and have a look at this whole process because then you are going to go ahead and understand the well to gate concept that we are talking about okay all right okay this is a slide that's for the mains perspective have a look at it go ahead and answer me this question guys again in the comment box i shall expect the answer for this okay number 1 bee is an independent organization under ministry of power number 2 bee is the nodal authority number 3 my bad should be 3 okay the emission standards for green hydrogen production have been released by the bee which of the above are incorrect you will let me know all right next india's first pure green hydrogen plant is in jorhat true or untrue and brown hydrogen is based on both renewable and non renewable sources okay i have given you the flow chart shouldn't be a problem okay you don't need to go ahead and remember all of this because eventually there's a lot more to remember for the examination than simple concepts like this theek hai you will let me know the answers in the comment box guys and if you have any particular questions for me originating out of this discussion any doubts that you face go ahead 
shoot me a message on my Instagram channel. All right. Okay. Let's look at bricks now, guys. Very, very quickly. Chito, chito. Okay. The BRICS summit coming up soon. Next tomorrow, in fact, day tomorrow and day after, the Prime Minister of India will be in South Africa. He will be attending the BRICS summit. A keenly watched summit, by the way. Okay. A lot of talk, jib jab, jib jab, going on for the last say, two, three weeks. Okay. There was also a rumor that uh, the Prime Minister will not be coming, which was refuted by the South African Foreign Ministry. Okay. So obviously the whole world is watching this. If people are caring enough to go ahead and spread rumors about the summit, you know that it's of importance. It has come of age. Okay. So let's look at BRICS. Brazil, Russia, India, China. Now what do you find? They are among the world's 10 largest countries, well, in many categories. And then finally, you are looking at, say, Russia, say, except, exception of Russia, Brazil, India and China are, say, emerging powers. China has already come of age. It's an emerged power, which means as a block, okay, as a block, one would not be wrong to say that BRICS can be compared to G7. Just in terms of, say, the population they represent, the kind of challenges that they face, the kind of solutions that they propose, and the kind of relevance that they have in the international affairs arena. Is that a very uh, logical correlation to make? So from the main's perspective again, I would prepare an answer for this. You know, this comparison between BRICS and G7 is something that I would prepare for. All right. So what you're finding now? The Brazil, uh, South Africa joined the last. Now they were originally identified for the purpose of highlighting investment opportunities, which means they were looking at closer economic integration. However, that now has uh, expanded its ambit. It is no more about the economy now. Okay. What you're finding is that now it is considered as a foremost geopolitical rival to the G7 bloc. From the main's perspective, here is here is a question for IR that I would definitely prepare for. You know, considering that G7 has been in the news in Hiroshima, wherein the Prime Minister went. If you have been following this editorial edge, you will know that he went ahead and talked about reforms in the MDGs in the multilateral developmental institutions. He talked about reforms in the United Nations. In fact, if you read the statement that was released after the G7 summit, you will realize that the Prime Minister's words were taken uh, very seriously, not just by the Secretary General of United Nations, but also by the Global Committee of Nations. And why is that? If you seek to understand it on a very larger plane, it is because India's presidency of G20, it is making sure that it is using this opportunity to go ahead and talk not just about India, but also about larger number of issues. So one is the multilateral developmental institutions reform. Number two, United Nations reform. Number three, uh, say climate financing. Number four, the role of, uh, say, global south countries. You know, how you go ahead and, uh, say, engage in equitable justice, you know, distributive justice. All of those concepts India is talking about vociferously, which is why G7 versus BRICS becomes a very key concept. Okay. Huh. <clears throat> So the BRICS summit comes as countries across the world are confronting a changing geopolitical landscape. Okay, what you're finding is the Russia-Ukraine crisis. You're also looking at the US-China. The problem of de-dollarization is also there. Okay, now in terms of US-China, you're looking at the term decoupling. Again, the you know this third topic that I'm discussing has immense relevance for this year's mains. So anyone who's writing this, uh, this year's means, make sure that you're at least adequately prepared on these angles. Okay. Uh, if you have to go ahead and follow this editorial edge, it will help you because these have been discussed in say various discussions over the course of the last 60 days. Okay. However, if you find pressed for time, which you will be, go ahead and engage at least in a basic ana analysis of all the particular factors, which go ahead and lead to the emergence of BRICS now as a, 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 a body. And what do you find essentially? Because of these particular factors that are happening, say the US-China decoupling, not just say economically, but in tech, in science, through military. All right. What you find essentially is that uh, uh, many people now, many countries from say the other countries, you know, outside BRICS and GS, uh, G7, what do they, uh, what are they tempted right now to do? They are tempted to join at least one party. No one wants to be leave, left out of this uh, emergence of new block that is happening. Okay. Again, counterbalancing that with say China's BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, the flagship project of President Xi Jinping. You know, he's using say the BRI 
not just for as a model of say, economic dominance, but then making sure China's geopolitical imperatives are met in the short and in the long run. Do you realize? So a lot of interplay is there when you talk about BRICS as a body and BRICS as a body versus G7. All right. So we'll seek to understand that over the course of the next 10 minutes or so. Okay. So while the big BRICS countries have been seeking, now number one, look at it, the de-dollarization angle. So obviously all the BRICS countries have an interest and you would agree on this, you know, as a body, yes, de-dollarization will benefit the BRICS and individually, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, China for sure will be the one that will benefit the most out of de-dollarization. Okay. It seeks to gain the most from the fall of United States. Okay. So let's understand this now. They have been seeking to reduce the reliance on the dollar for over a decade. Now, what you find is that the Western sanctions on Russia after the invasion have accelerated the process plus the intent, you know, the intent of say BRICS as a body to go ahead and engage in de-dollarization. So let's look at the intent here now. Number one, common currency benefits. Okay. Obviously, you're looking at better trade, better integration of trade. However, there is a flip side to it that yes, the rosy times, the good times will be collective, but so will be the bad times. So maybe, say a resilient economy like India might still figure out its way. What about say Brazil or Russia? Or what about say South Africa that again have high degrees of inflation? Okay. Boost intra BRICS trade, obviously, you are going to eliminate the high dollar conversion rate that is there. Next, each of the BRICS countries supports this for a different. Now, look at it. As a body, we have agreed that yes, BRICS has a stake in de dollarization, absolutely. But individually, too, you find that they have their own motivations. Okay. So, you, unless you understand these reasons, your answer will not be able to include the analysis that the evaluator is looking for. Okay. Before I go forward, see how you have to analyze topics for means. Okay. If you're a newcomer, if you're someone who's watching this for the first time, make sure that you include this method in your, in the way you read your newspapers. Okay. Never, under, never correlate reading a newspaper with understanding a topic. Okay. That's a mistake many students make, including say those who have attempted the examination previously. Mere reading of the article will get you nowhere in life. First, read the article. Thereafter, try and correlate where the article fits in the topic because UPSC expects you to know topics, not articles. Okay. So, Russia and forefront now, Russia and China, they stand to gain the most. Obviously, sanctions have been hurting Russia. The Russia-China friendship, well, de-dollarization will help them immensely. Next. <coughs> okay. China is also looking at say, its own yuan, you know, that finally a day shall come when the dollar will be replaced by the Chinese currency. All right. But then for the regular watchers of the series, you will know that there are many reasons that impede the process also. It's not say simple or as straightforward as uh, say one day you push the dollar out and get the yuan in. That doesn't work like that. Okay. More than 17% of its reserves are in renminbi. Russia has a greater preference for transacting in the Chinese yuan. Understand this too. Many people uh, counter, uh, in fact, do not probably know international affairs enough to comment on it. But the problem here is this, guys. Okay. So in international affairs, say if these are my stakeholders in this conversation, okay, many people will break down the relationship of India and Russia to say defense deals, arms deals, or say military engagements or cultural relations. Okay. Many people will talk about say China and Pakistan just in terms of say CPEC, okay, that investments of China has increased, the rail network, the Kashgar rail link and all of that. Okay. However, there is other relationships, this whole mixture also has other factors that as an aware civil servant you should know of or at least aspiring civil servant, my bad. Okay. Just a, Shubha just a minute Shubhankar, I'll just come back to your question. Give me a second. Okay. What you find is that Russia, after it was hit by sanctions, okay, here is the Western sanctions going and hitting Russia. This has straight away led Russia to engage much more closer with China. And one of the primary reasons of that engagement is that Russia's own forex, its own reserves, more 17 to, is it 17%? Yes, 17% of that, it is in Chinese currency. 
Okay. Now, at times, historically, if you have, and like, okay, I shouldn't build on it, but historically, if you take a look at it, the whole Western agenda often is to drive a wedge between Russia and China. Because these two together pose a credible challenge to the West's proposed or say, supposed hege hegemony. Okay. So, because, say, Russia has 17% Chinese currency in its uh, reserves, obviously, it stands to gain a lot out of de-dollarization and support China in its mission of de-dollarization. Okay. Now, India is also wary of this fact. Counterbalance it with, say, the Indian uh, uh, Partnership Security Alliance that is now developing with United States. Okay. All of these together have come to the, uh, basically, this summit is going to decide whether a common currency will originate out of this. But please understand the factors that are at play here. Okay, it's not as simple as saying, okay, today we throw the dollar out and get the Chinese currency. It doesn't work like that. Okay. So, this is the question. Can BRICS come up with a new global currency to go ahead and rival the USD? Not just say Chinese Yuan. Can they propose a monetary order? Okay. That is agenda number one at this meeting. All right. Number two. So, the arguments for global currency, go ahead and have a look that obviously you are looking at greater economic size. Okay. USD accounts for 90% of the global foreign exchange transactions. It controls the organizations, the institutions. All right. IMF, WTO, you know, are largely controlled by the Western bloc, which means the BRICS block will be found wanting there. You are also looking at the BRICS bloc having a GDP of over 32.72 trillion, 31% of the world's GDP. Okay. So, obviously, as, as a whole, when you look at BRICS versus USA, okay, you find that yes, they have the obvious advantage here. But when you look at say BRICS versus G7, then that becomes a very close game. Alright, okay, okay, let's look at your questions for Bunker. See, India's proposal also is there. See, the whole thing is, Shubankar, you have to understand that now the dollar's position is, say, under threat. Or if not under threat, at least being questioned. Everyone will go ahead and propose their own alternative. So, the Chinese will come up with their own model, say, Yuan. Okay. Someone else, say, India would also like rupee to become much more international. At the same time, you're looking at BRICS as an organization now, advocating for a common currency. If, say, BRICS were to go ahead and advocate for a common currency, do you think that it will only be BRICS who will advocate for a common currency? Do you think that the G7 might propose another counter currency, say, uh, against the BRICS currency, if it were to be launched? Do you understand that? So, there are many factors at play. Obviously, India has put its hat into the ring also. But you will find is eventually, it will be a block. It will be an economic block that will say make or break the dollar. Deepanshi, good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Okay. So, growing financial outreach. Obviously, US controls the shots in terms of organizations and institutions. Okay. In terms of, say, IMF, WTO, World Bank, what do you find is it's largely the Western bloc. So, if you control the systems, well, you control a lot of the pro institutions. Why do you think Russia had a problem when it was thrown out of the SWIFT mechanism? Why do you think Russia straight away advocated for getting back into the SWIFT mechanism? Because straight away you have to realize that today all the processes that are created, including, say, the organizations that run those processes, are run by say Western powers, which is why even though you have say a big country like Russia, which is say holding a, on its own on the military field against the Western might, even then it straight away had to ask to be pulled back in this swift mechanism because its banks were getting hurt. Do you understand that? So once you create the order, you create the business that flows out of the order, which is what USA has done. Correct Priya, obviously like I told you, many reasons obviously. Plus, you also have to understand that if the dollar were to be replaced, there are many currencies that will put their hat in the ring. Okay. And India should be one of them. There is no doubt about that. Okay. So, alright. BRICS established a new development bank. Now, what I suggest, in terms of, say, the examination perspective, the CRA, the NDB, okay, make sure that you know them. Did I talk about the CRA, guys? Let me have a look. Okay. Make sure that you take a note of this particular slide, okay, here, this one. So, what are the initiatives? Because what the examination is going to do is list out all of them and say which of them have to do with BRICS. 
you should know that the contingency reserve agreement okay contingency contingent reserve arrangement the new development bank the brics payment system okay and the rest are obviously their publications that they come up with they are all to do with brics initiatives you will go ahead and today after the class ends go ahead read about the new development bank where is it headquartered what is the contingent reserve agreement if you have any particular doubts reach out to me in style more i'll be more than happy to clear it out for you theek hai all right okay so let's look at india's challenges now number 1 political intentions behind de dollarization while india has its own interest in say promoting the rupee it knows that if the dollar falls the most likely replacement is the chinese yuan uh, the chinese currency ren maybe which means that uh, well india may, it's not a win win scenario for india after all okay number 2 increase dependence on china if that happens trade deficit with china goes up straight away we are already struggling with a one way flow of goods okay and risk arising from the exchange rate of volatilities like i told you the good times kingfisher times will be together but the day the feces hits the fan well is going to be together it's go everyone is going to be collectively hit okay so would again a resilient economy like india it will might be able to manage how about say south africa or brazil high levels of inflation already okay again would this make sense because india you know pulled out from the rcep because of chinese fears of dominance china's dominance okay so if india was willing to pull out of the rcep you will tell me uh, which particular organization runs the rcep the regional comprehensive economic partnership jaldi se bataiye mujhe chat mein so if india pulled out of the rcep on fears of chinese dominance well why do you think it is going to go ahead and propose the de dollarization or at least take an active part in it correct thanks shubhankar you are very kind for that thank you so much but answer the questions guys tell me rcep which particular uh, body or organization or association of countries is running rcep bataiye mujhe all right so okay have a look at the membership you are going to find that uh, most of it obviously has to do with fomo now the fear of missing out you know all these middle countries no that have been on the fences so far now they are having to pick a side pick either g7 or brics and what again what you find very not very surprisingly is india is engaging with both you know it's playing with the g7 in hiroshima you had the prime minister go and attend and obviously it's a permanent it's a part of the brics okay so in terms of the international relations uh, arrangement what you find is india is using this g20 presidency like if you have been following the news the kind of meetings that have been taking place the outcomes that arise out of the meetings and if you look at this vision statements that are released more often than not india takes a stand of the collective theek hai india takes a stand of the collective all right all right guys that concludes uh, today's class short class 40 50 minutes but what you find is we have covered three very important topics okay go ahead and answer the questions for me in the comment box All right. If you have any particular questions for me that you would like me to address for you, well, you can reach out to me either on my Telegram or you send me a mail on bhuvan dot jha at uh, studyiq dot com. Correct, Shubhankar. Lokesh, Loki, hi. Good morning. How are you? Welcome, welcome. Okay. So I see the like count is abysmal. If you like the discussion, if you found it useful, if you like the strategy that we do here, forty fifty minutes of intense discussion, no verbal chit chat, no nothing here there. Go ahead and hit the like button for me. Okay. and i'll expect your answers in the comment box till i see you tomorrow morning 6:30 am with another set of topics i'll take your leave thanks for joining have a productive day bye bye